Welcome to the Food Chronicler, where I explore the topic of food systems. I am your host, Tommy Bleasdale. I grew up on farms and I have built gardens. I have a PhD in food systems and I've worked in the food industry at both the local and regional levels. My passion for food has been lifelong and now I'm bringing that to you. Food systems shape what you will eat every single day. They're like looking at food from 35,000 feet up. To kick the show off, I'm going to explore the most important food group that you never think about. Anthropologists state that human domestication of cereal grains was the dividing line between hunters and gatherers in what we recognize as civilization today. In modern times, 50% of the human diet is composed of cereal grains. The human population of 7.5 billion is directly linked to our mastery in cultivating cereal grains. Yet, what are cereal grains? All the cereal grains belong to a specific family that biologists refer to as peyote. Don't worry, I'll never use that word again, because you know it as grass. Yeah, roughly half of your diet is grass-based. Think of wheat, corn, and rice, to name just a few. Science also tells us that human evolution took place upon prehistoric grasslands. Most productive farmlands today are still located on what was once grasslands, and some 50% of the world's land mass is covered with grass, which can easily be seen from space. Yet, grass's evolutionary success was not a foregone conclusion. Grass almost didn't survive. Around 35 million years ago, grass was forced into a series of epic battles that would last literally millions of years, and it faced multiple opponents and overwhelming odds. Before humans, before our history began, there was grass's struggle. And if it wasn't for that struggle, the odds would be against you being here to watch this today. Coming up next on the Food Chronicler, the sacrifice of grass. Living in the shade of giants, then the world began to change. Grass first shows up in the archaeological record roughly 110 million years ago. However, until about 30 million years ago, unbroken forests dominated the surface of the earth. Grasslands, if they existed at all, were rare. These forests created thick shade which left little opportunity for grass to reach sunlight. So for the first 80 million years of its existence, grass only had the chance to grow when a break in the forest canopy appeared. There are still some primeval forests left today. The Bushtyavisca forest in Poland is thought to be the last remaining temperate primeval forest in Europe. The population of Europe has been so high for so long that most forests have been cut repeatedly over the ages. But what makes the Bushtia Visca even more amazing is that it gives us hints and clues as to what ancient forests probably looked like. And one of the things you're going to notice in these pictures is there is almost no grass. What grass there is exists only where trees have fallen or along the edges of rivers where trees have been drowned by floodwaters. The Amazon forest is an example of a primeval tropical forest. Here, we also find an almost grassless world. The Amazon jungle is one of the few places on Earth where grass species are still considered almost entirely unsuccessful. Grass simply could not effectively compete with the shade of the jungle. So, for the first 80 million years of its existence, grass is relegated to living in the shade of giants. Then the world began to change. Forces from the center of the Earth radiate outwards, causing the Earth's crust to crack and continents to shift and move. From this movement, mountains rose up, and it is here, scientists believe, that grass would start to establish the destiny we know and depend upon today. To examine this, I am going to need a green screen. Mountain formation is an important step for grass because it is on the slopes of these mountains and the valleys beyond that grass and forests find themselves in rain shadows. Early rain shadows were fundamental to the development of grasslands. But wait, what is a rain shadow? To understand that, we need to know a couple of nautical terms. Centuries ago, sailors noticed something strange. Mountainous islands would have a wet side where it always rained and was forest dominated. They would also have a dry side where forests broke apart giving way to grassy scrublands. 
these mariners observed that the wet side of the island would be the side where the prevailing winds pushed into the mountain, and the dry side was protected from those prevailing winds by the mountain. They named the wet side of the islands the windward side, and the dry, protected side of the island was called the leeward side. Experts still use the vocabulary of windward and leeward to describe the phenomena of rain shadows. Clouds are essentially evaporated water pushed along by wind. Great, but what happens when a cloud strikes an object such as a mountain? The cloud has to rise up to pass over the mountain, and as it rises, the air gets colder and colder, causing the moisture to reach its dew point. Once it has reached its dew point, raindrops or snowflakes fall on the mountain below. Now that the cloud has lost a lot of its water, what remains of the cloud crosses over the mountain and descends into the valley. There, the air tends to warm again, making it less likely for the cloud to form more raindrops. So the windward side of the mountain will get most of the rain, and that is where you're likely to find trees. The leeward side will get less rain, and that is what we call a rain shadow. The leeward side is also more likely to have grass and scrubland. 30 million years ago, a new set of mountain formation created rain shadows. Forests and grasses found themselves stuck in these new rain shadows. And there, grass faced a tough new challenge. Any astute observer will notice that trees outlast grass during a drought. The reason is simple. Trees have deeper root systems and it is not uncommon for tree roots to reach a depth of 20 feet. Grass roots typically have reach around 2 feet. This allows trees to locate deep water, whereas grass only has access to surface water. In these rain shadows, we shouldn't expect to find grass-favored environments. We should, instead, expect to find a few shrubby trees struggling for water and little to no grass. But that is not what we find. Instead, we find grass-favored environments, and this creates a mystery. Grass had struggled for 80 million years to compete with the shade of primeval forests. These new rain shadows ought to have been the trump of doom for grass. The trees could simply outlast grass in drought conditions. But grass wasn't done yet. True, it couldn't outgrow trees, it couldn't reach deep into the earth for water, but the world was about to see what grass can do when it is outmaneuvered and outresourced. Grass took the only action left. If this generation couldn't survive the encroaching trees and drought, well, then grass would assure that the next generation would. The romantic in me likes to think that grass called out to the sky, and the sky, seeing the plight of grass, responded. In the ultimate deus ex machina, the atmosphere lit up with electricity and lightning rushed to the earth. I like to believe it was at that moment that the world discovered what it meant for grass to sacrifice. For grasslands, they're like the mythical phoenix. They perish in fire only to be reborn anew. What makes grass fires special is they burn fast and don't heat the ground to the point where it kills the grass roots. What a grass fire does is provide a lot of open space, free of trees and other competitors for the next generation of grass. Trees, bushes, and shrubs which had all once soaked up the sunlight and water are cleared away in the grass fire. And once the rains do come, the grass roots reactivate and a new meadow is reborn from the ashes of its ancestors. It turns out grass's evolutionary strategy was very different from that of trees who had invested in individual size and strength for survival. Grass's primary regeneration cells, called the meristem, are located at the bottom of the plant. This means that if the leaves are destroyed by fire, the grass can regrow from the base up. This allows grass to sacrifice, and also explains why we mostly find grasslands instead of trees in rain shadows. Trees cannot survive repeated rounds of grass fires, and grass can thrive in a treeless environment. 
Grass's strategy has proved so powerful that ecologists now have coined a phrase to describe the type of environments that grasslands can create. They call it a fire ecology, meaning that the landscape will periodically burn and clear away the competitive pressures of trees, bushes, and shrubs. And fire ecologies remain healthy only because they burn. Where are some of the famous rain shadows formed by mountains? Probably the one you're most familiar with is the North American Midwest. The Rocky Mountains create the short grass plains of the Great Prairies. The Tibetan Plateau forms an extreme rain shadow, and that mountain range there is the Himalayas. The windward side of the Himalayas is jungles, similar to the jungles of the Amazon Basin, whereas the leeward side is grasslands and desert. Today, we're surrounded by grasses, and 50% of our diet is made up of cereal grains which are grass seeds. Most of our farm animals live on grasses as well. We would not be here if it wasn't for the early struggle of grass. But grass's plight had only started. There was a lot more to come. If the first challenges were physical, continents moving, mountains forming, and growing rain shadows, the next two were, if anything, a lot more deadly. Next time on The Food Chronicler, Climate change makes the news almost daily as we face a warming planet. We ask ourselves, what is going to happen and can we survive these changes? 35 million years ago, grass was confronted with a climactic shock so extreme, it altered the trajectory of all life on Earth. In an event scientists now call the Grand Kapir, the Earth started cooling rapidly. The polar cap in Antarctica formed, crushing the forests at the South Pole under miles of permanent ice. As the cold started to reach outward from the poles, grass suddenly had a problem, as did everything alive. Quite literally, winter was coming. If you have any questions or comments, post them below. I'll be filming a video about the concept and science behind this episode next week, and I'll respond to you there. Share this video with anyone who you think will like it, and thank you for watching.